our speaker, Mr. Todd Mitchell. He is our American Fellowship of Cowboy Churches director. And uh, so he's here with us today. Todd, uh, he does live in Alabama. And uh, check, check. Would you be jacking with me? He, uh, he, he lives in Alabama, but uh, he has spent a little bit of time in Texas, and, uh, but we love him to death, and uh, you know, Todd is, is one of my mentors, he's one of my heroes of the faith, and, uh, but he's also a good friend of mine, and so I'm privileged that uh, he's here today to bring you God's Word, so y'all give him a warm welcome. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for reminding me. I get stuck sometimes and need help. My wife's pretty good at finishing my sentences, so I would encourage y'all to listen. And if you want to finish my sentence, go right ahead, okay? I, I've been away for a week, and I'm kind of ready for somebody to finish my sentence. Well, it's been a, a blessing to get to think about standing here and being with you. It is amazing to have watched over the past seven, eight years that I've known Matt what the Lord has done through his people right here at Stillwater. So my hat is off to you. This morning, I want to tell you about a little brief meeting I had the other day. I ran into a fellow that was a bit maker, and he wanted to give me something so that I would remember him, but he had no idea what he was giving me was going to become a message. He handed me a spur owl. I know the folks in the back probably can't see this far. You know what a spur owl is, though, here. And on it, though, what's unique about this, and some of y'all may have one in your pocket, stamped on it is the letters P U S. H, push. Well, it kind of makes sense because when you take this and put it on the spur, this is the device that pushes the horse in the direction you want it to go. Now, the other day when I preached this message, I had to slow down and teach how to use a spur because I didn't think everybody in the crowd quite understood it. So I believe, Matt, your people understand that there's a correct way and an incorrect way. Did y'all know that to use a spur? But what does PUSH stand for? It stands for pray until something happens. And, and it's interesting that, that you guys have just finished a series on prayer, and I asked Matt, can I preach the bonus sermon? Can I, can I talk about prayer? See the, the rowel on the spur? It's nothing but an aid, okay? It's an aid, and, and some people use the rowel as a gas pedal. How many of y'all use your spur as a gas pedal? You can raise your hand and own up to it. There's one honest guy in the far back. My goodness. Matt, do you think this is a gas pedal? If you're in a jam, it is. Some people think, now maybe some more will raise your hand. Some people think it's a steering wheel. How many of y'all believe this is a steering wheel? Well, 
I believe this is to get in position. The whole reason you'd want to steer it is to get it where you want it to go. So today, now, here I'm going to let some of y'all others that aren't horse riders to raise your hand. How many of y'all believe this is a torture device? <laughs> I thought I'd get more hands with that. This one is flat, filed off, and it don't have no spokes or, or, or anything on it. But it's important to know how to use spurs if you're going to ride with them. Not only is it important for you to know how to use spurs, but it's important for a horse to know how to accept. Because really all it is is aid, okay? It's an aid for you to communicate with that horse. And, and I remember years ago I had too many horses and I had this really neat lady who was a trainer deluxe and she was helping me and I had two colts. And every time she would go in to feed those colts, she, now, does any of you ladies have them long thumbnails? Somebody does. Well, this lady had beautiful long thumbnails, and when she would feed those colts, she would go in every day, and the things I never had time to do. My, my method of feeding is... She would feed them, she'd go in there, handle them, once she got them gentle to touch, a few weeks later, I noticed she would take that thumbnail and she'd stick it in their side. And she might start up near the shoulder and when it'd step over, she'd quit. And she'd walk around to the other side and she might stick it down here and it's, it'd step over and she'd back off. And the amazing thing is when that colt was old enough to saddle, you could get on it and guide it anywhere you wanted to go with your feet because she had already taught it how to accept those spurs. Well, again, we're talking about prayer today, and we're going to tie this together. But to loosen y'all up, I got to tell my first, can you remember the first time you ever got to wear spurs as a kid, hopefully? I remember as about a 10, 11-year-old kid, and by the way, those two young men that stood up here and, and shared and prayed, where are y'all? Did they leave? They're, you guys are awesome. But I remember being just a little bit larger than these two young men. And my uncle had a walking horse barn. And, and if you've never been around a walking horse barn, there could be a 150 to 200 feet long and there's stalls on either side. And the hall of the barn is about 20 feet wide. And they work those horses against the stall fronts. And they just beat that dirt down. They'll just be troughs where they've worked those horses. They go down, they stop, they turn around. Well, kids got to ride the young horses. I don't know why. I guess we were the test dummies. And they put me on a two-year-old filly one time, and, and she didn't have any energy. She didn't want to go. She didn't want to engage. She didn't want to get in gear. So they said, let's put spurs on him. Well, I could barely ride anyway, and they ride English, no horn to hold on to saddles. So they put those spurs on me, and they say, gigger, gigger. So my little old legs that barely reached down below the saddle hit that filly that had never had spurs, and she takes off. Remember the part that I don't hold on good, my seat's half. Well, she didn't get in gear, so I'm just bouncing. 
Well, I get about two-thirds down the runway, and I realize we're coming to a wall, and I'm out of control. She's out of control. I'm out of control. So what does your mind do in that brief second? Somebody said it. Jump. You panic. You're not smart enough to trust. I'm not. I'm not smart enough that that animal is not going to hurt itself. And I looked to the center. And I thought, that ground's hard. <laughs> Back then, Spider-Man was the big deal. Early 80s. Those stall fronts had that hog wire on it. My mind said Spider-Man. <laughs> so I leap off this horse and try to grab the wire. Well, y'all can imagine. That didn't work out too well, and that's why I remember it so well today. Guys, what is it in your life that's You've had that brief moment. Now, us men heard an incredible man of God last night speak. General Boykin. I enjoyed Chris Cox, too, but General Boykin really challenged me on prayer. But how many of us have that moment? Maybe it's a moment of confusion. Maybe it's a moment of fear. Maybe it's a moment of need. And we think, do I sit and trust? Do I bail off? Do I jump? What, what am I going to do, Lord? None of y'all have that moment, I guess. Well, I, when... J.D. handed me this. It made me begin to think. And I was taken to the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bible, we're not going to read a whole lot today because I heard him say y'all had a lot going on. And I was sitting there trying to figure out what all you had going on. And I know they were trying to tell me not to preach long. <laughs> it's okay, Matt. I called it. <laughs> and yeah. And you know, as I studied, let me give you a little background in case you've never jumped into the Old Testament and tried to figure out who Nehemiah was. Now I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a a, a guesser here. I'm gonna guess you've heard a sermon on Nehemiah, how Nehemiah <laughs> went and gathered the people and they rebuilt the walls. How many of you heard a sermon about Nehemiah building the wall with one hand while they fought or had weapons in the other hand? And for me, I've heard Nehemiah preached, and you men, I mentioned it yesterday in the elder camp, I've heard it preached, and in my mind, I'm a physical. I don't know about your mind, but I, I, I hold on to physical things. So I, I, I hear about something getting done. I hear about you guys moving from the tunnel <laughs> you know? And, and and I learned something. Did y'all know that, that before we got a hold of the Bible, that the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah was one book? I did I, I'm not studied enough to know that, guys, so I'm learning. I'm learning. See, Ezra was about four hundred and fifty eight years before Christ, and Ezra was sent to rebuild what? The temple. About 12 or 13 years later, Nehemiah is sent to 
rebuild the wall. So let's pick up in verse 1. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hecali. And late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, that's how we say it in Alabama, <laughs> I was at the fortress of Susa. And I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4 is really, when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Before we sink our teeth into verse 4, remember me asking you, what do you do in that moment? I don't know about y'all, but a lot of my life would be different if I wasn't so impatient. And that's one thing I respect of you and your pastor. You guys were patient. But what is it in your life that you pray to God, God, I need it today. That bill comes due. You got to get it paid. What about the impossible? Are there things in your life that just seem impossible? God, there's no way we could ever God, there's no way you could ever. How many of us doubt God? I do. I'm human. I have Jesus Christ in me. But I still believe some things can be impossible. You want me to tell you when we really get down and start praying. Remember, pray until something happens. It's when something's important. You want me to talk to you about what's important? <laughs> at the little church I'm at, we have a man who's 12 months past due. Hmm? They found cancer a year ago, stage four. They removed one of his kidneys. He had a spot in his lung. The options the doctor offered him weren't good. So he said, I think I'll go home and trust the Lord. Now, I'm not recommending this. Hold up, guys. Don't, don't misunderstand. That man had no options. His options were take a treatment that's going to kill you, prolong your life a month or two, or go home and live out your month for a life or two. Live out your life for a month or two. And he walked up to me last Sunday and he said, man, I'm in my 12th month. I have no pain. I do what I want to do. But you know what? There's people praying for that man. 
And I can tell you what that man's been doing. He's been praying. When your health becomes a concern, praying gets pretty serious, doesn't it? When your family, those of us raising teenagers, when your family has a trouble in their life, it becomes pretty serious. Here's where the Lord changed my life 18 years ago. When your drinking becomes too much and your marriage becomes too little and you want to save your marriage and you got to turn loose of your drinking, praying becomes a pretty serious deal. That was something that I thought would be impossible. I had done it all of my life since I was a kid. And my marriage, my wife told me if something didn't change, she was leaving. What do you do? What about your career? Some of us go through career changes. When you go through that career change at my age, it's pretty serious because there's not a lot of do-overs at my age. But you know, guys, where I find myself today reaching out for God is when I Realize that sin has crept back into my life. And you know, I truly believe that when sin begins to come into my life is when I can feel God, the Holy Spirit, poking me in the ribs saying, step away from that, step away. Get in position. You know, I'm going to briefly touch on verse 4 again. When Nehemiah heard, he sat down, he wept. Not for a moment, but for days. He fasted. And I know Matt is a teacher and a believer in fasting. And I'll challenge you. Your telephone runs your life. You can't hear God because your telephone's ringing. Put your telephone down and pray. I, I fasted from my telephone one time. I got through. I came in, some guys said, I tried to call you, and I said, I don't care. I was fasting from my telephone. They said, oh, I couldn't do that. My life would fall apart. And I thought, well, who's in control of your life, you or him? You know, I was going to say, pray until something happens, and we're talking about prayer. And the first time I preached this, how many of y'all are football advocates? We okay. How many of y'all are football people? Nobody here? Matt, do they talk to you? <laughs> Let me train on them. Any football fans? Oh, college, that's right. I'm from Alabama, and I don't like Alabama. I'm an Auburn fan. But how many of you played, maybe, and how many of you, just backyard football. That's where I had the most fun. Backyard football. Do you all remember in backyard football, the Hail Marys? Everybody, every kid's wadded up down there at the end of the backyard and you just throw it up, and they fight it out to see who gets it. But when I look back on my prayer life, and I know I'm get, going a little against what General Boykin said last night, 
but I thought about it, and I believe General Boykin, when he was praying those short prayers, I believe that man was walking in the Spirit every day of his life. And if you're walking in the Spirit, you can throw Hail Marys. Lord, here it comes. But I can only look at where I've been. And where I've been, I have not always walked with the Lord. But I look back and there's so many times that I would just have to lob something up and say, Lord, help. But then I began to realize the Lord wanted to hear from me more often than just when I was in what? Trouble. So I began to talk to him a little more often. Amazing. But let me help you with something. Oh, is there any young people in the crowd? Young people, I love it. Young people, who remembers what a collect... No, don't tell me who remembers. Who in the room does not know what a collect call is? <laughs> That's what my prayer life was like back in the day. For the young people, go home and ask your parents what a collect call was. I'd have to get an operator to call God, <laughs> see if he'd accept my call. Because he didn't really hear from me much. But let me tell you, Psalm 139.4 says, you know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. Did you get that? There's other places that hear that God and David says, Lord, you hear my innermost groans and moans. Well, let me encourage you. I'm going to give you four P's right quick. Prayer has to become a priority in your life. For Nehemiah, he didn't think about all the people he had to gather up or all the materials he had to gather up. He didn't think about he had to get approval from the king. What he thought about was getting in position and making prayer his priority. Look at the book of Nehemiah, and he prays continually throughout the book. He got in position. We've talked about that. He stopped. How many of us, when we're nervous, or we got to make something happen, how many of us sit down Versus run ahead. Most of my life, I've been the charge guy. If we got to tote something, let's pick it up and tote it. When maybe I ought to stop and pray that Matt would come get one in and help me tote it. Whether he'll do that, y'all could tell me, I don't know. He does for me, I don't know about for y'all. What about perseverance? How many people in here, are pers do you know what perseverance is? It's not quitting. It's not giving up. It's continuing when you don't want to continue any longer. My wife persevered. And had it not been for her perseverance... We would not be married 25 years with two children. We wouldn't have. But you know what Nehemiah got from his prayer? You can read it. I'm not going to take you to the verse. 
But the hand of the Lord was on Nehemiah. And I hope that I pray and I seek God's grace because I'm not perfect. Nobody in the room's perfect, guys. Quit kidding yourself. None of us are perfect. God's grace is all right there for us. We just have to reach out for God's grace. And I'll end. I may have skipped something. It's okay, y'all are in a hurry. You got a lot to do and I talk slow. In case Matt, in the past five or six weeks, didn't talk about how God answers your prayers, I want to briefly tell you. I, I know I, I keep elders in my life. I keep mentors in my life for a reason. I'm not that smart. Okay. If you will find smart people to teach you, guess what you become? Smarter. So one of my mentors shared this with me. God answers our prayers in four ways. The first one we all know. What's the, what's the one answer we always know? I just said it. No. We pray a prayer, and when we're not right... Or, and, or the prayer's not right. Probably that quick no is, I'm not right, and what I'm asking the Lord to help me with it, and what I really need is not right. So the answer is no. Took me a while. Children don't like no, do they? Take a kid to the candy store, spend 20 minutes in there, and tell him no. But that's how we act. How about slow? God's answer might be slow, meaning maybe the time's not right. Maybe it's just not today. There's also an answer God gives me all the time, and that's grow. God doesn't want me to get out of that bind. God doesn't want you. If you put pressure, how many of you feel like God's got his spur in you and you're begging for release. God, I don't know if I can go on any longer. He's taken me all over the world trying to teach me to quit telling him what to do. And I'm a slow learner. I had to grow. I have to continue to grow. And the last one is go. I'm right, the prayer is right, and the time is right. <coughs> Guys, I don't know what you need this morning, but I know who knows what you need. I know who would love for you to make a collect call if you haven't talked to him in a while. Or maybe you're the person that don't know God. He would love to hear your voice today. It's not real complex. I may have made it sound like more than it is. You want to know how I talk to God? 
Most of my God times driving down the road. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Dear Lord, thank you for my beautiful family. Dear Lord, thank you for a job that feeds my beautiful family. Dear Lord, thank you for my mother, because my mother loved me when I was not real lovable. Dear Lord, thank you for my daddy, because he taught me and he corrected me when I needed correcting. <coughs> Somebody pulled out in front of me. Dear Lord, thank you that I didn't have road rage. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Help us all. Lord, touch the ones that need touched. In your son's holy name, amen. What a bonus message, amen? What a bonus message. You know, one of the things that I, that I worry about in my own life is that y'all go ahead and stand with me this morning. We're going to sing one last song and uh, kind of close it out like we normally do. But one of the things I worry about in my own life is I don't ever want to be in a spot where I can't hear the Holy Spirit talk. And, and so this weekend has been wonderful because I've been able to hear the Holy Spirit talk. And one of the things that I want for you as my people is for you to not hear a man, but for you to hear the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Todd, for speaking, letting the Holy Spirit speak through you to me today. Listen, if you are here today and you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you were there last night and you couldn't sleep all night, but you're here today. Just meet us right over here and get that tended to. Maybe there's something weighing on your heart, on your heart that's heavy today. You need prayer. If you want us to pray with you, we're going to be right over here. Let's sing this last song, and you move if you need to move.